As the name suggests, in this lecture what we'll be looking at are the different types of effects that can be present in more complex experimental designs. Now by more complex, what I'm referring to here are exactly the types of designs that you're going to be instantiating for your second research project you're going to be conducting in your groups. Now in general, the extension we're going to be looking at is moving beyond the simple variable manipulations that we were doing when we were considering t-tests in the past. That is, moving beyond just two levels of one single independent variable. That is, moving just beyond two group comparisons. And as we're going to see, there's many interesting questions that can only be answered with these more complex designs. In particular, what we're going to focus on in this lecture are two specific types of special complex questions. That is, those concerning nonlinear effects and those concerning interactions or combinations of variables. We're going to talk about a couple other very basic types of effects in these designs as well, but these are the two extensions, these are the two unique types of questions that we're going to be able to address. So let's think about a very basic research question. Does arousal increase performance? And that is, as you increase the amount of arousal and you get somebody more involved or you heighten their senses when they're performing a task, does their performance on the task increase? Well, so you want to test that hypothesis. So you can you set up a design, okay, and you put people under different levels of arousal. So what we're going to plot here is performance on some given task, four different levels of arousal. And say that you do have a two-group study that we had in the past. You have a low level of arousal, and you see performance, a uh, decent level of performance that you can see here. And then you put people under a greater level of arousal. So you increase your manipulation, put them under a high level of arousal, and you see performance goes up. And this might be a situation that we can analyze with the t-test. We find out that it's significant. We see that there might be a very large effect size. And therefore, we might be able to claim, yes, it does seem that increasing arousal leads to an increase in performance. But then the question here is, is that really the end of the story? Now, in only a two comparison, that's the only claim that we can make. But then you can think about, well, what happens if we do another manipulation? That is, what if we increase arousal even further? What if we had had three levels of arousal in our study, an even higher level of arousal, that then would turn our previous high level into, so let's say, this is now a medium level of arousal. What is now going to happen as we increase arousal even further? We see that it's gone up as we move from our first to our second level of arousal. And based just on those results, if we're going to make a claim that increasing arousal increases performance, then we should expect to see an even greater level of performance under our new highest level of arousal. Well, that may not be the case. In particular, we might collect data and find that performance goes back down once you get under an even higher level of arousal. This is an example of what we call a nonlinear effect. That is, it's a situation where performance starts to move in one direction, and then at some point it turns around and heads back in the other direction. Now, we talked about nonlinear effects a little bit when we discussed correlation in 293, and how calculating correlation actually wasn't able to detect or wasn't appropriate for determining nonlinear effects. And this is an example of what we're seeing here. Performance goes up as we move from the low to the medium condition, and then back down moving from the medium to the high condition. Now this isn't anything wrong with our design. You can also imagine what if the situation where we had just done what are shown now here as the low and high levels of arousal. Well there we only have two groups, the low and the high, and in this situation as well, you can see because they have the same level of performance, there we would conclude that arousal doesn't have effect. It's not until then we're adding this third middle level of arousal that then we would see, well, in fact, there is an effect of arousal. It's just all the action is happening in the move from the low to the medium or from the high down to the medium. In other words, in that middle level of arousal. So this is the key argument for why in a lot of situations, it's going to be important, especially if you have something that you can scale from low to medium to high to very high to extremely high or whatever the case may be. If you have a variable that can arguably be manipulated at multiple levels, it's important and it's going to oftentimes be sort of a best practice to include at least three levels of the variable. So then you can determine whether or not you truly have a linear effect that you might claim based just off of two levels or whether there might be some nonlinearity involved. So this is the advantage, and in fact it's the rationale for you guys to include at least three levels 
of at least one of the variables so that you can examine whether or not such a nonlinear effect might be present within that variable. For those of you that are interested, we've talked about this example before in terms of arousal. This is what's referred to as the yerkes dotson law, over, um, named after two of the, the authors uh, that, that have really examined this. The, the first and then the, uh, the one to popularize this um, specific relationship between arousal and performance, and in particular this nonlinear relationship. So just as we've seen that you can look at determining nonlinear effects by simply manipulating the number of levels you have of a single independent variable. There's also going to be specific questions that we can only look at by having multiple independent variables, regardless of whether they exist at two levels, three levels, four levels, so forth and so on. Okay? And that's exactly what a factorial design is designed to do. In particular, a factorial design is a design that uses two or more different what are going to be called interchangeably factors or independent variables. Now importantly what it does is it includes every possible combination of every level of each of these factors. Okay, So it completely crosses them to produce every combination that you might have. So if you have two different variables that exist at multiple levels, then what you're going to do is take the first level of the first variable and pair that with every level of the other variable. Now I know that sounds kind of confusing, so let's look at some specific examples. And in particular, looking at these examples is also going to identify how we refer to these types of designs. And this is something that you should become very familiar with, because from this point forward, when we're talking about these types of designs, we're going to just rattle off this uh, uh, the conventional use or the nomenclature on, on how we identify these designs. So it should be something that you're familiar with and you're able to identify. For example, when I say a 3x3 three three factorial design, okay, what that involves is two different factors or two different independent variables, each of them having three different levels, to produce an experiment with a total of nine conditions. Now let's unpack that a little bit. When I say a 3x3, three three, which is how this 3x3, three three, if you will, factorial design is read, is a 3x3 three three factorial design. Each number that I'm including here identifies an independent variable or factor that's in my design. So regardless of what these two numbers are, whether it's a 3x3 three three or a 5x2 or a 20x20, 20 20, the fact that there are two numbers identifies that there are two independent variables in my study. Now the number itself tells me how many levels there are for that specific variable. So the fact that this is a 3x3 three three design tells me that there's two different factors. The number 3 attached to each one of them tells me that each one of these has three levels. So, for example, if what I have here is low, medium, and high levels of arousal, and then I might have three different stimulus types, such as words, objects, and faces, then those are my two different independent variables levels of arousal, and stimulus type. Each one of them is existing at three different levels, and so the factorial design would cross all levels of all or of both of these factors to produce nine different conditions. In other words, I would have people who are under low arousal that are seeing the pictures of faces, I would have low arousal seeing pictures of objects, and I would have low arousal that are seeing words. That's three conditions. Then I would have medium arousal seeing faces, medium arousal seeing objects, medium arousal seeing words. Those are three more conditions. And then finally, at the last level of our first factor, at the high level of arousal, I would again have every one of the levels of the other factor. That is every one of the stimulus types. High arousal seeing pictures of faces, high arousal seeing pictures of objects, and high arousal seeing words as the stimuli in some specific study. So again, what we can do is to use this type of notation to describe really any type of design that has multiple independent variables or factors, each one having multiple levels. Let's look at another one. If I say that I have a 2 by 2 by 3 factorial design, again we know that each one of those numbers represents an, a different factor or independent variable. The number itself tells us how many levels that factor or variable has. So a 2 by 2 by 3 factorial design lets me know that I have 
one factor with two levels, another factor with two levels, and another factor with three levels. And what we're going to do is come up with every possible combination of each of the levels of each of those factors in our experimental design. In this case, there would be a total of 12 conditions in our experimental design. Now the great thing about a factorial design is it is a very comprehensive and systematic way to investigate a number of possible types of effects that can be going on. In particular, what it lets us know about is whether or not each of two different variables, two or more that is, are having an effect. So in the 3x3 three three factorial design, we can see whether or not there is an effect of arousal, and we can simultaneously see whether or not there is an effect of stimulus type. But furthermore, what we can do is to see whether or not the effect of arousal is different for different stimulus types. In other words, as we move from low to medium to high arousal among just the face stimuli, is the effect there the same as if we move from low to medium to high arousal among the word stimuli or the pictures of objects? And this is exactly this sort of combination of effects is exactly what we're referring to when we talk about an interaction effect. So if increasing arousal has a different effect for words than it does for faces, that would be an example of an interaction in that first example. Now in a factorial design we can look at in particular three different types of effects. When I said that we can look at the effect of each variable on its own, so each independent variable, the effect of just arousal globally or the effect of stimulus type globally. That's what we refer to as a main effect. In other words, regardless of what stimulus type we're looking at, if there is an effect of arousal, that would be a main effect of arousal in this study. So we're looking at the effect of one variable regardless of what's happening with the other variable. We could of course then also look at the main effect of stimulus type regardless of level of arousal, is there a difference between these three different types of stimuli in our study? Now, then when we're looking at, is the effect of different stimulus type different across different levels of arousal? That is exactly what we're referring to, as I mentioned, as an interaction effect. That there's a unique combination of these factors that's producing an effect. The last thing we can look at is whether or not there are specific simple effects of one factor at just one level of the other factor. An example of this would be if we look just at low levels of arousal, is there an effect as we move from faces to pictures of objects to words as our stimuli? So notice how this differs from a main effect where we're looking at the effects regardless of the other factor of arousal. A simple effect is looking at just one level of arousal. And again, you can flip this around and say, okay, for just the word stimuli, is there an effect as we move from low to medium to high levels of arousal? That would be an example of a simple effect of arousal for just the word stimuli. Now we're going to look at some more examples of this in class and have you guys identify whether or not different effects exist. But we can also go through some other examples in the following lectures section as well.